Well, a very good evening and welcome to Grace Baptist Church uh, this Lord's Day evening. Thank you very much for joining with us tonight. If you're a regular with us, again, we, we thank you for joining once more with us and we do pray that the Lord will bless you this Lord's Day evening. If you're a first time viewer or listener, uh, again, we thank you for joining with us and we do pray that the Lord will encourage you as we meet round his precious word together. In the next few weeks, we intend to be um, meeting physically on a Sunday evening in the Glen Eagles Daycare Centre. But we will continue to use this format on a Sunday evening. Um, I will maybe record the Sunday evening service a little bit earlier and we will put it out on Sunday evening on Facebook, on Premier on Facebook, uh, so that those who can't join with us physically on a Sunday night will be able to join with us virtually and come round God's Word um, as you have been doing over this last year. So we intend to do that as long as there's no technical hitches and my tech guy doesn't abandon me once more. But that's what we intend to do. But again, thank you very much for joining with us this Lord's Day evening. We just have the one announcement for this incoming week and that is on Thursday evening. It will be our uh, weekly Bible study and prayer meeting at half past seven. That's over Zoom this Thursday evening. And we will continue our mini-series on Second Peter. Uh, it's a very applicable book and letter for this particular time that we live in. So that's this Thursday evening at half past seven over Zoom. If you want the details, you want to join with us, please contact myself through Facebook um, or Mike again through Facebook or email. Um, that is all our announcements this week. We do know that they are in the will of the Lord. Let us come before the Lord this evening. Let us bow our heads and seek his face, seek his help as we come round his word. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, again as we're coming to your presence this evening, Heavenly Father, we would ask that you would just take control of this time, that Heavenly Father, your spirit will be in control of everything that is done and everything that is said. That everything that is done and everything that is said glorifies you, Lord. Lord, this is a day that has been set aside to worship you in truth and in spirit. Help us to do that, that very thing this evening, Lord. Help us to come uh, this evening to worship you in prayer, in praise, and in listening, and in applying what we hear to our lives. Heavenly Father, so often we come into a meeting and, and we sit and we listen and that's it. But Heavenly Father, help us even this evening to apply these things that we hear tonight to our lives. Lord, we live in a world that is evil, that seems to be getting more evil each and every day. Lord, we see the, the, the end of the age coming very soon. Lord, help us to be ready for that. Help us to be able to witness to others about that very fact, that one day you are coming back to, to, to get rid this world of evil, to bring back your bride, back into heaven to worship and serve you for all eternity. Heavenly Father, help us to be ready with a word in season for those people who are at this particular moment in time have no hope. They look at this world and, and they see that there's no hope and they're helpless in this world. Help us, Heavenly Father, to be able to give them a word. Heavenly Father, help us to be able to give to those people a word to those people who are so negative who are so anti everything about religion, everything about Christ, everything about God, everything about his church. Heavenly Father, give us a word for those people as well, that we may be able to witness into their lives. Lord, help us to be a light in this city. Help us to be a light in this world. This is a dark world. It needs light. Heavenly Father, we have the truth. We have the truth in your word. Help us, Lord. Let us not be afraid to spread that truth, that light. So Heavenly Father, again, we would ask that you will just undertake for this time that we have together. Be with each and every one of us. Help us to focus around your word this evening. And Lord, as we come to praise you through song, oh Heavenly Father, help us to listen to the words, to meditate upon the words, because they are so true, simple, but so true. Heavenly Father, we pray for these things in our Saviour's name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to have an item of worship now, and this is a favourite from someone in the church. Um, 
and it is a hymn that is very simple it's very old it is very simple but it is I am so glad that our father in heaven the words will come up the tune will come up you'll be very familiar with it you probably know most of the words and you may be thinking actually this is more of a children's song it's not look at the words meditate upon the words and worship our God because he loves us I am so glad Amen. Amen. Simple words, but very true indeed, aren't they? If you can turn with me in your Bibles uh, to Revelation chapter 6, we're still in Revelation chapter 6 this evening, and we are looking um, at the sixth seal this evening, and that is found in Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 to 17. So Revelation chapter 6, verse 12 to 17, and... This is the sixth seal that John is talking about in this portion of scripture. So this is the word of the Lord. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. 
Then the kings of the earth, the great ones and the generals, the rich and the powerful, and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling on the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Amen. And we know the Lord will add his blessing to the public reading of his inspired, infallible, inerrant word. Now, just before we start out this evening, I, I want to tell you that I'll be looking at a, a number, I'll be reading a number of passages from the Old Testament. And again, this is just to let you see that the readers of John's letter, the seven churches at Asia, they wouldn't be confused by what he is saying. It, it, this wasn't double Dutch to them in many ways. For in, to a certain degree, they could comprehend everything that he was saying. They understood the imagery that he was using. So as we come to the sixth seal, we're still in the throne room of heaven. It is still he that is worthy, the one who is worthy, who continues to, to reveal and break the seals. The Lord Jesus Christ himself, it is still, still him. So nothing has changed in that regard. And what we have in front of us is the ultimate decisive answer to the question, to the cry that the saints cried out when they were under the altar of God in verse 9 of this same chapter. O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? This decisive answer to their prayer comes at the last judgment, the final destruction of all things. And tonight we are going to look at this portion of scripture and we're going to split it into two. The first portion we're going to look at the shaking of the heavens. The second it will be the shaking of the earth, but more specifically the shaking of those who dwell upon the earth when the heavens are shaken. So the shaking of the heavens. And we see this in verses 12 to 14. And as soon as the Lord Jesus Christ opens or breaks this seal. So once more we see that Christ, it is he that is in control. It is he that brings all things to an end. It won't be any world government. It won't even be the Illuminati. It won't be some big red nuclear button that brings all things to an end. Not even climate change will do that. But it is Christ and Christ alone who will bring an end to all things. And what do we see here in verses 12 to 14? Well, first of all, we hear of an earthquake. And this wasn't just an earthquake. This was a, a great earthquake. A quake that shook the very heavens itself. This was a cosmic earthquake. It was off the Richter scale, quite literally off the Richter scale. So this judgment is not just confined to the nation of Israel or the area around about uh, Israel at this time. This is a judgment that includes all of God's creation. And here there is turmoil, turmoil that the world has never seen or witnessed before. And this would have been the same earthquake that we see mentioned in chapter 16 and verse 18. And we see with that description of this earthquake, the same thing happens. The islands and the mountains fled away, fled away from the, the one who sat upon the throne, the one who was judging the evil of this world. We also read of these things in the Old Testament. We see many descriptions like this in the Old Testament, how the prophets of old described the calamities of the last days. Just like this, what we've read in Revelation. They say that the earth was shaken to its very foundations. There was the darkening of the skies. The moon, the stars and the sun were darkened. The shaking of heaven. We see this in Isaiah, in Joel, Habakkuk and Ezekiel. In chapter 34 and verse 4 of the book of Isaiah, it says this. All the host of heaven shall rot away and the skies roll up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall as leaves fall from the vine like leaves falling from the fig tree. This is very similar to what we've just read in Revelation 16. Sorry, in Revelation 6. 
once again. So once again, the readers of John's letter will be familiar with this language and, and, and familiar with the words that he's painting with. Painting the end of the age, what it will be like. Also, I want you to notice this, that this is not secret. All will see it. All will hear it. All will hear and see the return of Christ. This is what the end of history will look like. And just as I said, it's described throughout all of the Old Testament. Now, some others would actually say that what we read of in verses 12 and 14, all that is is symbolic. It's symbolic language that John is using. They would say that this is just pictures of political turmoil towards the end, social mayhem, the unraveling of social norms, the breakdown of society and all the moral confusion that all that will bring. And certainly in many ways we can see that today. Of course we can. And it's gathered a pace over the last number of years. It's picked up pace and a pace that we probably never thought was possible in our lifetime. But that's what we see today. Turmoil, confusion, breakdown, mayhem. I myself personally believe that what we read here in these verses is a picture of the consumption of all things. This is the final judgment. Now, no doubt political turmoil and social mayhem may be involved in this. And in many ways, I don't think sometimes we can separate the two. But this definitely is, in my eyes, the consumption of all things, the final judgment. And as we continue to read on, we see this calamity, this devastation that will be inflicted upon the earth. And it involves the whole cosmos. The whole of creation. Remember what it says in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8 and verse 19, it says this. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Creation itself is crying out. It is gro groaning, just like the groanings of a, a woman in childbirth, longing for its deliverance. And that's what we're about to see happen here in these verses. Verse 12 tells us that the sun became black as sackcloth. So that's a picture of darkness. No light whatsoever. Now the sackcloth that has been described here would have been made out of goat's hair. It would have been coarse, very coarse, very thick. It was a garment that was worn by people in times of mourning. So John is telling us that the sun became like this. The sun would not be able to give out light. It would be covered. It would be covered by the sackcloth. And again, John is trying to describe the indescribable. But even here, he uses the Old Testament. For he refers back to the Old Testament for his imagery here. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 3 says this. I clothe the heavens with blackness and make sackcloth their covering. So the readers would understand exactly what John is talking about here. They would understand that. He then moves on to the moon. And he says the moon becomes like blood, deep red. Now we've all we could all probably say that we've seen a red moon at some point or at least a, a light red moon at some point it seems in the recent past there's been a lot of talk about the four blood red moons i think it was john hagee that was the instigator of that i'm not sure but i believe it was he probably got that from some jewish rabbi but let me just say at this point and i'll use an old theological term here all oh, that's nonsense nonsense and I'll quickly move on from that because I'm sure I've offended a number of people already, but even just by saying that one word. And I'll move on to a story. <clears throat> now, I don't know if I've told you this story before, but I remember coming back from our youth group many years ago. We'd seen uh, one of the films in the trilogy of Thief in the Night. I can't remember which one it was, but certainly it was one, one of the main talking, talking points after we had watched that film was the, the red moon, the moon like blood. And this was a sign. This red moon, this blood red moon was a sign that Christ was coming back. And that's all the talk of the, 
the church and the young people in the church. And I, I speak not a word of a lie. I remember walking home from church. Now, I can't remember whether it was on that particular night or the week later. But as I'm walking to my house, uh, we lived in a housing estate up in Tullock. We lived in Tullock Terrace and it was a long straight road. And I can remember starting at the end of <clears throat> this particular road and looking back and dragged directly behind me. It's almost as if it was following me was a moon the moon it was big it was full and it was red i quaked in my boots at that moment in time i was afraid looking back now i, I see how humor is humorous it is almost as humorous and as ridiculous as the four blood red moons but the consumption of all things the judgment on this world is no laughing matter once more, we see John referring back to the Old Testament here with a description of the sun turning blood red, specifically in the book of Joel. Look at that later on this evening when you have time. So the sun is darkened. The moon is turned to blood red, but it doesn't end there. There is more. Verse 13 says this, And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. So, very similar to what the verse we just read there in Isaiah, Isaiah 34 and 4. Now, as we look at this particular verse, it does seem to tell us that as creation itself is shaken, that the celestial bodies, the stars that are in the sky, those stars and galaxies that the Lord placed in the heavens and gave names to each and every one of them, knows them by those names. These seem to come falling down. They fall to earth. A picture of an incredible mighty meteor shower. Or possibly even asteroids hitting the earth? We're not too sure. He continued to describe it poetically. He says it's just like a fig tree. How the fig tree was shed its unripened winter fruit when it is hit or shaken by a winter storm or a winter wind. He describes it like that there. Then he moves on to verse 14. And we read that the sky above vanishes. Just like a scroll that has been rolled up, split apart and then split asunder. We, we read something very similar in the New Testament. Do you remember when Christ was being baptised by John the Baptist in the River Jordan? We read in Mark's account of this, we read these words. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. Now all these things happening together is a frightening scene that we have in front of us. It's a doomsday apocalyptic scene that we have. Then we see every mountain, so from Ben Nevis to Everest, from every island, from Sky to Australia, will be moved from its place. But I think this means more than moved. If you look at chapter 16, as I said, with the same earthquake, it says that the mountains and the islands will actually disappear, completely disappear. And I believe this is what is being talked of here. The islands and the mountains will all disappear under the wrath of God. Again, it is referred to in Second Peter, I think it's chapter 3, verses 7 to 10. Again, take a note of that and read that later on this evening. So what we read in verses 12 to 14 is the day of the Lord. This is a climatic celestial collapse of this world. This is the wrath of God. The wrath of the Lamb is here. That is what we are witnessing on these pages in front of us. Now, I don't want to be flippant at this point because we can't be flippant with such an important subject. But we need to tell people like Greta Thunberg, she ain't seen nothing yet. She really hasn't seen anything yet. It doesn't matter how many electric cars that we will have on our road. It doesn't matter how many solar panels we will all have in our houses in the years to come. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe that we have to look after God's creation. Absolutely. We should do all in our power to look after this planet. But one day, and it is coming soon, one day this earth will come to an end. I suppose we could say that Greta is right. But it's just not going to end the way she thinks it's going to end. Christ will return. 
and he will bring all things to a climactic end, to a devastating and decisive conclusion. This is what we see pictured here in these three verses. The question has to be asked, are you ready for that? Are you ready for that end? Next we see the shaking of this earth and as I said earlier on, more specifically those people who dwell upon this earth. We've just seen the earth, the skies and the stars being judged. The, the, the stars falling from the sky onto the earth. The, the moon is the colour of red, blood red. The sun has been darkened. And now we see the effects it has on those who are on this earth when all this is happening around about them. We see the effect it has on these people. We have many a Hollywood blockbuster that tries to portray the end of the world type scenario. I can't think of any off, off hand. 2012 maybe would be one of them. So there's a doomsday scenario. But they all fail. They completely fail as they try to portray the ter terrifying events that actually will happen. Doesn't matter how much GCI or G whatever is a green screen they have. They cannot portray it. How do you think you will feel if you're still here when the Lord returns? In his glory he returns. And, and all around you is chaos and calamity. Do you know as a Christian, when we see that and we understand the time, we know that our redemption draws near, don't we? And we should look upon us, even though in many ways it is terrifying with all these things happening around about. But we will know that the day of the Lord, it is the day of the Lord. And that he is returning from, for his bride. We will know that this is the great day of judgment. And his chosen people will be vindicated. We will know that this is God's divine, righteous and holy judgment on this evil world. The another side, can you even begin to imagine what it would be like for those who are unsafe? Those who are in the middle of this. Even the most hardened heart of sinners will know. They will understand exactly what is happening. They will know that it is judgment day. They will know judgment day has come calling. It has come at last. But notice the difference here. Last week we looked at the believers under the altar of God. Those who had been washed in the blood. And what did they cry out? What did they say? Avenge us. That is their cry. Those who are sinners on this earth, when the wrath of God is poured out upon this earth, what do they say? They say, hide us. Hide us. Now, don't miss that. Avenge us or hide us. These people on earth who have persecuted, oppressed, marginalized God's people, those people on this earth who have rejected Christ as their king, are about to meet him and are about to answer to him. Now, the people groups that are mentioned here, excuse me, tells us that it doesn't actually matter what your position is you hold here on earth is it doesn't matter if you think if man thinks of you highly it doesn't matter if man puts you upon a pedestal it doesn't matter if man thinks you're the lowest of the low in the day of the lord your social standing does not matter one jot it really doesn't for in verse 15 we see everybody described here no one is excluded no one has an excuse any advantage that one group of people think that they may have over another, it disappears. It's gone. There's no preferential treatment here. All will have to give an account. You will have to give an account. The kings of the day will have to give an account. The great ones, the generals will have to give an account. The rich, the powerful, the slave and the free will all have to give an account before Christ. And all these people groups that are mentioned here are mentioned later on in the book of Revelation in chapter 19 where we see those people who align themselves with the beast. But also we see similar things in the Old Testament once more. We read it in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 
33 to 35, where we see the people judged for their persecution of God's people. Also in chapter 2, where they're judged for the persecution and their idolatry and their wickedness. And what do they do? They flee to the rocks on account of this. Isaiah 2 verse 19 says this. And people shall enter the caves of the rocks and the holes of the ground from before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty when he rises to terrify this earth. In that day, mankind will cast away their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they have made for themselves to worship to the moles and to the bats, to enter the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the cliffs from before the terror of the Lord and from his, the splendor of his majesty when he rises to terrify the earth. So what we see here and in the book of Revelation are those who, who love their sin. And their natural desire is, their natural want is to sin. Those who are in rebellion against God and all that he stands for, what do they want to do? They want to flee from the wrath of God, but not just flee. They want the rocks, they plead, they cry out for the rocks to fall upon them, to hide them from the wrath of a holy God. Why would they want that to happen? Why would anybody want that to happen? You don't go on a holiday, a skiing holiday up in the Alps and then when you're up skiing, hope that you'll get covered by an avalanche. That would be madness. That would be just sheer stupidity, wouldn't it? But here, these people are witnessing. They're in the middle of the God of all creation bringing about the end of this earth. And they think that they can hide behind or hide below a rock that he actually created. How foolish can man truly be? But here they are so fearful of the wrath of God. This is their only cry. This can be their only cry. Hide us. Hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne. Notice something here. <clears throat> In that cry, they do not cry out for repentance. It's too late for that. It is too late for that. What they're actually doing is crying out for death. In the life that they lived here on earth, they chose sin over Christ. And now, in the great day of the Lord, they think that they can choose death. So that will relieve them of any wrath or of any judgment to come. It's a bit like Adam and Eve. When they were in the garden, they communed with God daily. They walked with God daily. They spoke with God daily. And when they sinned, they thought they could actually hide from their creator. How foolish can man really be? If you want to learn a lesson this evening, it is this. No one can hide from God. No one can hide or escape the judgment of God. He sees all things. He knows all things. He, he knows your words. He knows your thoughts. He knows your deeds. He knows your actions. He knows them all before they even happen. And yet from the very beginning of time to the very end of time and history itself. So from Genesis to the book of Revelation, man is so blinded by his sin. He thinks that he can hide and outrun God. Our, listen, our sin not only condemns us. It truly turns us into idiotic, self, self, senseless fools. Idiotic, senseless fools. That's what sin does. At the end of verse 16, it says that they want to escape the wrath of the Lamb. When Christ went to the cross, he went as a sacrifice. He, he was our Passover Lamb. That's what John the Baptist said as he, as he pointed to Christ, as Christ came towards him. The Lamb of God that, that takes away the sin of the world. And as Christ hung upon that cross, he bore upon himself the wrath of God. That those of us who were slaves to sin, who were bondage to sin, when we turned in faith to him, he gave us freedom from that sin. He gave us freedom from the consequences of that sin. But the lamb, the wrath of lamb that we hear of in verse 16 is different to that lamb that is on the cross. 
This is a conquering lamb filled with wrath. He is coming to judge sinful mankind. All mankind. Listen, this world is consumed. It, it loves, it is in love with evil. It's in love with sin. It delights in doing evil because man is conceived in sin. And because of that, he loves darkness rather than light. It tells us in Mark 7, it says these words. What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, idolatry, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and they defile a person. Man is inclined to all these evil things. He loves all these evil things. He loves them so he rejects Christ and he rejects God. And because of that very reason, Christ will come and judge and he will judge with a righteous judgment. Don't look upon this portion of scripture and say, well, you know, that's a bit harsh. Don't look upon it and think, well, that's a bit unfair, Joe. Listen, Christ has given mankind time after time, opportunity after opportunity to repent. Our God is patient. He's long-suffering. Listen, think about yourself this, this evening. If you're unsaved, especially if you're unsaved, Christ has given you opportunity after opportunity to come to a saving knowledge of him. You know he has. And even tonight is another opportunity. And if you walk away or if you turn this broadcast off without turning from your sin, then you've rejected Christ. You may say, oh, but, I, but I still believe in Christ. You've rejected him. You've still rejected him. And if you've done that, then you also will face the wrath of the Lamb of God. Verse 17 goes on to say, For the great day of their wrath has come. This is why they're full of fear. The day of the Lord has arrived. And as I said earlier on, it is too late for these people to do anything. They can't do anything. They've tried to run, but they cannot hide. And the thing is, if we read back into verse 16, these people know who they're hiding from or trying to hide from. They know. It isn't as if they don't know. They know that this is Christ who has returned. They know this is Christ and why he has returned to judge this evil world. At the end of all this, the most obvious question to be asked in the midst of this judgment, of this final judgment, is a question that it is asked at the end of verse 17. Who can stand? That's what the end of verse 17 says. God will bring about judgment upon the idolaters and the persecutors of his people. He will bring about judgment upon his enemies, upon the evil in this world, and no one will be able to stand. Not one. And don't think for a moment, don't think in your pride or in your arrogance that you will be able to stand face to face with Christ and argue your case with him. We will all come before Christ, saved and unsaved. We will either be rejoicing with him because he gloriously, he graciously, he mercifully saved us, or we will be standing before the King of Kings terrified because of his perfect pure and righteous wrath simply put it's either grace or wrath grace or wrath it's as simple as that where do you stand this evening are you saved or are you condemned when this day arrives when the day of the lord arrives as i said it will be too late to do anything far too late Look at this world that you live in today, that we all live in today. Man's heart grows more wicked each and every day, does it not? We see that on the television, on the internet. Sin becomes more depraved each and every day. The unbeliever's heart has become more hateful towards God's people. Again, we see that with people who stand in the, in the street and preach God's word. There's a hatred there. But listen... God will not stand by, 
not stand by idly and not vindicate his people. He will come in judgment. He will. It's written here. Are you ready for that judgment? That's what I'm asking you tonight. Are you ready for that? Listen, this passage of scripture for the believer, for the one who is saved, should fill our hearts to overflowing with joy. We should not be fearful of what is ahead of us. For our trust and our hope is in Christ. He is the one who opens the seals. He is the one who is sovereign over the seals. He is the one who is in control over all the seals and everything that happens. We should be happy. It should not frighten us. But listen, if you're an unbeliever tonight, if you do not know Christ as your personal saviour, if you have not turned from your sin, if you've not made Christ Lord of your life, then you should be quaking in your boots. And don't take that as being funny. You should be fearful. For one day, Christ will come back. He is coming back and he's coming to back to judge you. You. Listen, you won't get lost in the crowd. You won't be able to hide behind someone else. You won't be able to hide behind me because I'm quite big. You won't be able to do that. One day you will come before Christ on your own. And you will stand before the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And you will have to give an account of your life. Did you accept Christ or did you reject Christ? Is it wrath or is it grace? Will it be heaven or will it be hell? What will it be? Amen. Let, it, let us pray. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once more we, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you are coming back one day. That you're coming back to, to take your bride. You're coming back to, to judge this evil world, this evil age. You're coming back to destroy the heavens and the earth, to make a new heaven and a new earth. That Heavenly Father, that your, your bride will serve and worship you for all eternity. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that truth. And Lord, we, we pray if there's anyone who's listening this evening who has rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone this evening who has turned their back on the Lord Jesus Christ, loves their sin more than Christ. Heavenly Father, we would pray that you will speak to them this evening that you will petrify them you will show them a picture of what the wrath of God the wrath of lamb really is that you will give them a restless night that they will not be able to sleep that you will convict their hearts and they will turn to you in faith oh heavenly father that is our prayer and lord we ask all these things in our savior's name amen Again, just thank you very much for joining with us this evening. We do pray that the Lord has blessed you uh, as you've joined with us. We're going to close tonight with a song from Sovereign Grace Music, and it is I Will Glory in My Redeemer. Again, once more, the, the words will come up, the tune will come up. Sing praises to our God, for again, he is worthy of all our praise, of all our worship. And again, thank you once more for joining with us this Lord's Day evening. Thank you. <laughs>